that's awesome news of Cedarcraft. That is really, really awesome. Congratulations, my dude. Amazing. With that, we'll go ahead and start a little bit earlier than the countdown. Yeah. And welcome on in, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome on into the Dragon's Den. My name is Digital Dragon, a.k.a. Luke. Those of you that know me, uh, those of you that don't, I am a 3D printing variety streamer here on Twitch. What does that mean? Well, it means that we do everything from assembling and testing, evaluating printers to modifying those printers to building printers complete from kits. Uh, to doing some prototyping, like this printer right behind me, which is the Zero G Mercury One, which was built under a closed beta because it is a full frame build and fully enclosed. We also do some cosplay, like the helmet up here, and just other types of prototyping and fun. Welcome on in, everybody. I apologize sincerely for having to duck out and delay the stream for just a short bit. Yeah, I tried to scarf something to eat right before the stream and was not a great idea. So bad choices all around, but here we are. Once again, congrats to Cedacraft uh, for passing your commercial driver's license, your CDL test. That is amazing. Um, and I ask that you tweak your scene transition music down there just a hair or bump your mic volume up a bit. It's very jarring. I'm working on it, Thunder Keys. So I was using a different set of scenes. I have transitioned to a new set of scenes, and apparently I've got to go and figure everything out. And unfortunately, on the scene transition, I'm not getting anything for uh, like volume control. So I don't know if it's something I have to do. Yeah, I'm going to have to figure that out. So. Maybe I can do this. And let's see if you guys hear this transition when I switch screen. You guys hear the transition scene? Okay, good thunder cues. Yeah, so what it was is apparently I had the, the last set of scenes set <clears throat> as um, monitor only, not output. And if it outputs, then it outputs to the audio stream. And now it's just monitor only, which means it may be picked up by the microphone from the from the uh, monitor. So, yep. Hopefully that's much better. Hey, Maker Mind Nexus, aka DB3D Dan. How are you doing, my friend? We're doing good. We're just jumping in. We're just chatting a little bit as we get started, having a little bit of coffee with a, yeah, having a little bit of coffee. Um, yeah. So we had kind of a false start at 5.30 where I had to jump on, tell everybody I'll be right back and uh, go have a conversation with my dinner that disagreed with me. So, hey, Pete. You're working on the Voron and Sad, your new PSU for your Ender did not show up today. Oh, well, if you needed some, I got about three of them right underneath the desk here. And they're all mean well. So, I know that doesn't do you any good up there in, in the uh, Great Lakes area. You're in uh, the Chicago area, if I remember right, right? Somewhere up there. Go ahead and get the keyboard out of the way. And we have been working on our, about two hours south. Okay, we've been working on our Voron V02. Uh, we haven't put a name on it yet because this isn't destined to stay with me. This is being built. Um, KB3D provided the kit and I am building said kit. 
Um, and it's going to be going to a maker in need somewhere in the community. So when I'm done with it, I will get it back to KB3D who will forward it on to the maker in need. So, yeah, so we had some issues um, on the last stream, namely the X carriage mount had bowed some, so it was more rounded at the edge. And because of that, we could not put in the M3 hex nuts that we needed to put in here in order to mount this. And because we couldn't do that, we didn't run the belts either. But we did go ahead and work our way forward a little bit and we mounted our bed. So we may have to take that off shortly to put the wiring in for the, um, uh, the front LED on the bed. And we also went ahead forward and built our mini stealth burner tool head. So we've got this all built and ready to go. We did install and we are using the Voron Revo. So we will have the one handed quick change nozzle capability on this printer. And we're, that's kind of where we're starting. So we're kind of going back a little bit and we're going to work on belting the printer. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of move this forward and put a couple of stoppers in here just to make it easier to, to work around things without having it all the way in the back. So I'm going to put a couple of stoppers in here. Just front and back on both sides so that we can use the right size stoppers. Was that the right side? No, it wasn't. These were. Use the right size stoppers and they tend to work better. Hey, Zombie, how are you doing today? Zombie, you were working on a printer design, were you not? And did you make any headway or did you just decide that you're basically building another printer or, or designing another printer just like one that's already there? I know you're kind of having that philosophical question. Hey, K2 Kevin, how are you doing? Yeah, who doesn't need a Voron? It's, it's a, you know, the nice thing about this, I really, really, really like my V01. At some point, I may tear it down and just rebuild it as a 02. Um, just because there's some neat things on the V02 and some changes that I might like to try on mine. But I really like mine because of the fact that it's a smaller print volume size and chamber size. You can really heat it up quick. And it does everything a big boron does. It just can't do multiple parts at a time. Like, you know, if you had, you could probably do maybe two parts of this, you know, the larger parts <laughs> at a time. But so it's a little bit slower, but it's not bad. Uh, but it heats up really fast, too, so. Yeah, like I said, I, I, may, uh, I may talk to KB3D and see about getting the, because my, uh, my Boron V02 right over here, I call Baby Blue because it's the blue frame. And so I just have to see if they can get the blue top hat. And even if it doesn't match 100%, I'm not going to. I'm not going to cry myself to sleep over that one. Um, so let's jump over to the browser window. And yes, it's set up right. Good. Um, so speaking of which, we've got our uh, X carriage piece here. I've already snapped the front piece off um, of this. And I did go ahead and put the two heat set inserts back in. So really we're starting with putting our M3 nuts in at the top here, and then we'll get going on this build. Eagle Brett, welcome in. Hey, Cap Tubes. Hey, Aaron, how are you doing? Do you use Bowden Drive printers? I do have a few Bowden Drive printers. Um, the... The Vorons are direct drive, but I use so I use reverse button tubes in them. 
and I use a three millimeter inside diameter, um, just a tube I get off of Amazon, but I do have the, put the screen real fast. The Flying Bear here, it is, well, once again, it's a direct drive, but reverse Bowden tube to the side. Um, yeah, the closest thing I have to a Bowden tube today is the Prusa Mini. Everything else that I have, whether it came from the factory as a or as a Bowden has been converted to a direct drive extruding system. And I do have Capricorn tube. I've been getting Capricorn tube for a while. It's really, really good. Ooh, and these are going to be really, really snug. So that's going to be nice. I say that because now I've got to figure out how to get them down in there. Ninety percent of the way with that one, then step down one. Hopefully, be able to get the rest of the way. Oh, there we go. And there we go. So we got our two X head nuts. Whoops. Probably gonna be hard to see, but we did jam our two hex head nuts down there. So they're perfectly lined up with the holes. So we're good to go there. Some M3 by 8 flathead cap screws. So these are going to be some kind of outliers. There we go. So we'll need two of these and two of our Maker Beam XL nuts. But yeah, I definitely like the Capricorn tubes. I've used them a lot. Um, I just don't have any printers that aren't direct drive anymore. Kind of weird. Okay, and what we're gonna do is your screw comes in from the front and your uh, nut's going to go in this recessed back and you're going to want to just get it started and not tighten it down because you're going to have to get your your belts in there so basically just um, screw it in far enough that you can feel the um, screw popping out of the top of the nut and that'll allow you to have plenty of room to route your cables Trying to think what else I have in the works as far as machines go, because I have another 2.4, which will be a direct drive. I'll have the black box, which I believe is all direct drive extruder system. So yeah, I, I don't really do anything that's that's Bowden. Uh, it's more reverse Bowden these days. So now that we got that, we need to get our belt started. So it says to start with an equal length of belt. Um, so line the two butt ends together, meshing the teeth, go all the way down to the bottom, and in one cut, trim the ends of both belts. 
so that they are equal. You will need one meter of belt for each run. Okay. I mean, I've got a yardstick down there. I could definitely, or yardstick, a meter stick down there. I could definitely just run out a meter. The other way of doing this, and I've done this in the past, is route a belt and give yourself a little bit of length and then go through and cut it and use that belt to measure. And that's probably what we'll start off doing here. Um, so let me just figure out which way I'm going. Now, you know what? We'll just cut it in half and follow their their guide. We'll just do that. No big deal. I sit here and go, oh, well, I'll keep it and I'll have like a little end for something. No, no, I won't. I won't keep it. I know better. So I'll come back to the main camera. What I did was just, I just kind of unrolled it all. And then we're going to start. We're going to take our two ends and we're just going to marry them up so that the um, the groove of one slots into the groove of the other. And then from there, we're just going to pull our hand down through it, keeping the grooves lined up, and that's making sure that we're keeping the teeth count the same between these two belts. Yep. Yeah, I saw you working on it a little bit last night, but I had to pack it up and go to bed a little bit early because I had a early doctor's appointment today for my eyes, of which they dilated me and then sent me home without any sunglasses or, you know, the little fake sunglass strips, which was a blast because I was going home about noon. Um, my buddy was driving, of course. So my buddy being evil diesel was driving. So we got home and uh, hey, Pezliz, thank you for the resubscribe for five months. Holy, as Nomi would say, banana balls. So what I'm going to do is we, we're down to the end here. I'll probably just come over here to make it We're down to the end and I'm going to find one of the one of the tails and just snip through the the valley of the teeth right and then I'll start at this end get them lined up once again so I know that the side on the back is high so the side on the front is low and I'm just going to work my way through it again. And we'll, we'll make the cut on the other side. And that will guarantee that I've got the same number of teeth in both of these belt pieces. And I can tell you right now that these are going to be way long, that they gave us way more belt than we needed. But that's an LDO kit as well. They always give you extra. Whether it's belts or screws or, you know, spare wire or what have you, you always get extra. I have a feeling I slipped a belt somewhere. No, nope. no, I shouldn't. Okay. Now I'm down at the other end, and you see there's just a little bit of extra. So that first exposed valley is where I'm going to cut. And that means that our um, belts are now the same size. So, 
We're going to start with one. Whichever one we, we grab. Eagle Brett, how's it going? Welcome on in. And it wants us to start by setting our belt into the um, into the grooves. So what I'm going to do is there's there's language on it. We're going to leave the language so it'd be facing up. And we flip this over and we come in from the back. So we're going to go in under that belt and then you may need to have something just to poke it through and out the hole towards the front of the printer. So what we're trying to do is get our belt to come in the side with the belt teeth facing the back because there's there's grooves in this part and it's going to go behind our nut and then down into that groove and coming out the front. We only need a couple of teeth. So we did that on one. Now we're going to grab the belt on the other one and do the same thing. Make sure our words are also in the right direction because, well, OCD. And what we're going to do is we're just going to try and get the same amount of belt length, same number of teeth on the belt. We'll get the same number of teeth and we're going to tighten down that side. So we don't want that belt to be going anywhere. Okay, and that's going to put us coming out this way when we start to run our belts. And then you also want to make sure that your tensioner rods are fully loose so that your motors are pulled all the way towards the chassis. So they're, they're out. Right, so loosen up your knobs, righty tighty, lefty loosey, lefty loosey. Loosen up your knobs, pull your motors all the way to the outside, and then you'll be good. And if you want to make definitely sure that they go nowhere, grab your two millimeter driver, and I'm just gonna tighten down the two bolts that are closest to the rail. And what that's going to do is lock the motor so as I apply initial tension by hand, I'm not going to move the motors. Oh, and we got an ad break. Oh, yeah. I love this frame color. This is a really nice color. Um, and I was a little worried with going with the purple, but I think this purple and red just is awesome and even the red parts that we've used which is a fluorescent red by um part of 3d um it looks awesome as well and it goes you know it, it goes pretty well with this red it's not as dark but it does add that accent to it i don't know if cyborg has pink frame zombie but KB3D Chris is in the process of putting together a 2.4. He'll be working on it again tomorrow night. Um, so he does his streams Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. And he'll be working on his tomorrow night. 
and it's an orange powder coated frame. So they, they're they working with a local shop um, that uh, does powder coating. And yeah, you don't know about that Chris guy. He is, he is a little shady, but if those, if that orange frame that he has works out well, then if they can do powder coating in pink, then you should be able to get a pink frame. Yeah, DLL PDF. There you go. That that's actually the company that he's working with. And folks, once again, I got my S Runner mug, and there is. Whoops, where are we going? Ah, here. There's some merch, a link to a merch store. If you do bang merch, there will be a link to the merch store. Uh, bang or exclamation point merch in the chat will be the link to the merch store. Right now, the only thing I've opened up and published is the coffee mug and the stickers because I know that those, like the size of the logo will work out right. Um, I've got shipment notifications for my samples for both of those. So I'll be able to get those, check them out, and we'll be drinking with that on stream as soon as it gets here. And then I've got a, a t-shirt and two different types of hats coming that I need to check out because at least the hats are doing embroidery. And the way my logo set up, I may have to use a slightly different logo for the embroidery. Um, because I'm not sure if it's going to get too muddied with them trying to do the embroidery on it. Okay, so we're going to be dealing with the A and the B belts. Now looking here, um, they tell you that as we're looking at our belts, B is the top, A is the bottom. So A is the bottom belt. So we're going to start with the A belt first. Okay. And as we start with that A belt here, we got to use the lower belt to make this run. And always be good. Untangle. Thank you. And what I'm going to do is Where's my other? And grab a couple of. No, those will just take regular ones. I'm going to grab a M2 by 6 socket head cap screw. And what I'm going to do is mount the, I'll say the rear two holes of the mount, meaning. The rear two holes here, not the front two. I'm going to mount the rear two holes and the front two holes, which will hold this off the front. That'll just make it easier because this won't be flopping around as I'm trying to run all the belts. Um, so I'm just going to run a couple of screws in there real fast. And it's not even going to matter if, if I could get this tight or not. I just need it to um, prevent this piece from sliding all over the place. Okay, and once again, we're going to be using the lower belt. Let me get this one out of the way. And this is our lower belt. And what we're going to start off with is going around the lower pulley right here on our end. Nice thing is, is this has a curve to it, which is going to help us get in and around that pulley. Possibly. Maybe. Maybe not that wants to come right out the side, so we'll have to help it around the pulley like that. So we're going to go around the pulley. We're going to come around the front, so we'll just pull this through. 
making sure that we stay locked on that pulley. I just rode high over and off the pulley. Okay. Grab one of these and stick it in here as well. Okay, um, through this just a bit, let it act as a bump stop. Then will wrap around the front pulley. Then at the rear, because we're going on the bottom belt, we've got the two rear pulleys here. And so what we're going to do is go around this pulley, around the drive motor, and then come back out and go around this pulley. This may actually be kind of a pain in the tuchus to get in there, get around that pulley. I have to use your tweezers to grab hold of the belt and help it through. We're having a, like a head cam or a GoPro that I could put on my head would probably be a good thing. There we go. Nope, nope, nope. In there. There we go. And so there's our belt. And we're around our pulley here. So we just need to make sure that we get any tangle out. Get it continue to riding on that belt path. Okay. Turn this around. And we're going to go around this outer edge. And come up. So we're just going to go around the outer edge and it's just going to lay in there. And then we're going to come through this pulley and right along the front side of that extrusion. That would be our first belt. And like I said, just cutting it in half, we're going to have a ton of extra length. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to come over to about like here. I'm going to cut it long just to make it easier to fish around the back and in. And see, like I said, that's that's a pretty good loop of belt. We can we can do two or three uh, z axes. Actually, probably about two uh, rook z axes with this. Yep. Rook takes nine hundred millimeters for reference. Um, is that for the the each of the a b's or is that all together, zombie? Because this would definitely work great on a belted Z on a rook. I can probably get at least two of them out of this section here. 
Guess I might have to build a couple more rooks. Okay. And we'll worry about fishing that in a minute because I'll have to take this off and it'll make it easier to get it fished in there. So the B belt. We start off, we're going to come through the right and we're going to go around at the top here. So we need to come through at the top and pull through. Hey, Killbot, thank you for the follow. And once again, we'll make sure that we're in that path there. We're gonna loop around because we just have one pulley at the top that tells me that this is just a wraparound. And then on this side, we're gonna go through the pulley up here at the top. Once again, we're gonna take our excess edge Put it in and try and move it around as much as possible by hand by shoving it through and then we'll tack uh, we'll take our tweezers and we'll try and just grab that belt and work it through which should be a little bit easier because this belt is the higher belt versus the lower belt Watch your belt tension, make sure you're following in the right belt pass and everything is staying in its grooves. Okay, and then this is gonna come around the front. And we're gonna loop around this rear pulley or this top pulley. This is where you, you could probably just kind of give it a curl and it'll help you out. Yeah, it this top extrusion really does give it a little bit more um I don't know if the word stability, but uh, rigidity to the pulleys here and keeps those um, nice and tight. Um, I've seen some rooks that have the, uh, all right, now what I'm doing is since these belts are routed the same way, I'm just going to make sure once again that they are all writing in their grooves that they're you know that they're in the grooves of the pulleys because now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to follow this out and i'm going to cut this at the same length So we measured them to be the same length. We exposed the same number of teeth on the starting side when we started. Now we've cut them to the same length after they've all after they've both been properly routed. So that means that as we're tensioning, as long as we can pull both of these belts through the front and they're at the same number of teeth, then we should have the same tension roughly on these belts. So, during the belts, now we're going to go ahead and, and route our belts the same way, which means I need to take this piece off. And we're going to do the same thing that we did before, which is route our belts 
underneath and then push it through to the center. So we've got to make sure that we get the right belt in the right spot. So this is our bottom belt that I've got, and it's going to go on the bottom side. We're just going to push it in underneath there, and it's probably going to hit the belt on the other side and just needs some help to get pushed through. So just grab our, uh, this is the 1.5. Just going to use that to help push it through. Hey, thanks for the, uh, the lurk zombie. That did not push through. Cheat a second here. So I'm going to pop this one out. Didn't mean to really throw it all over the place. I'm going to pop this one out and I'm going to take these belts. Because we're trying to put two belts side by side through a small hole, it's a little bit of a pain in the focus. So if I can at least get it started. And make sure you're getting the right belt going into the right slot. You don't want to cross your belt. That one started. We're going to take the other one and get it started. This is kind of the fiddly part. There's not too many of them. This is, I'll say this is almost akin to trying to do the front idlers, you know, riding the belts on the front idlers on a Trident or a 2.4. It's not hard. It's just fiddly. Yep, of course Zombie would spill his coffee. And of course, it's you know you always want these these holes to be somewhat, we'll say tight, and then you're trying to push a piece of rubber through a a tight hole. And don't go there, people. Always a pain in the tuchus. Come on. There we go. So we got that second one through and started. So I really, really need to get a close up camera that I can show. So what we've got now is we've got both sides of the cable coming through. And I took the nut plate off of the one side so i need to put whoop so i need to put that nut plate back on and just loosely because then we're going to use a pair of pliers to tension this by pulling these out at the same length so that's how we'll set our initial tension on this so we need to get our nut laid back in place here and a couple of threads screwed on.
Okay, got a couple of our threads screwed on there. We're going to make sure once again that our belts are in the right spot. And we're just going to start pulling these belts through and tightening them up just by hand. Making sure that they are riding in their bearings and not riding up. Like it looks like this side over here just rode up a little bit. So drop it back down in your bearing. So let me bring you guys in closer and we'll take a look at this. Right, so we're, we're in our bearing channel. In our bearing channel, this is riding through our bearing channel and is around at the right height going around our pulley. Both of these are in the bearing channels. Both of them in their bearing channels. These two are in the bearing channels and seems to be wrapped right around that pulley nicely. Bearing channel, bearing channel. Now what you might see, um, let me set you down real fast and loosen this a bit. You might see that you've pulled it tight but you've pulled it tight like this, which means you're not sitting in that bearing channel right. And if you go to tension this, you can get it tensioned, and then when you start running it, it may drop down in here, or it may just shred your belt out. So always make sure that your belts are in those bearing paths. And we're gonna start off, like I said, just by pulling them out the same length We'll go ahead and I believe the next step is we're going to mount this truck up and then we're going to use a pair of pliers to pull this and get it good and tight. Hey, hey, Maker Viking, how are you doing? Welcome on in, my friend. Welcome on in. Hey, Otters Danger Gen. I didn't see you in there. Raising. Uh oh. Yeah, I actually made that lurk message because, well, I'm the, I'm a big coffee drinker and everybody knows it. That's apparently seems to be what I'm known for is always having coffee. And when I switch the scenes and I'm using stream elements versus own 3D Pro for the chatbot right now, the command that I had used over an own 3D that would randomize the response isn't working on stream elements and I haven't had a chance to really dig into why. So I just switched it to a static one of, I spilled my coffee, gotta go clean up the mess. Cause it goes well with the theme. Yeah. So welcome on in everybody. Uh, let me grab another sip of coffee. Preparing some food. Soon back to working on your project. How are you doing? Uh, well, doing well. Um, I prepared some food earlier. It did not like me. And so we, we got a late start on the stream because of that. But uh, yeah. So we pulled the belts through. We got them secure. We made sure that we didn't cross them up and down. Um, now we're going to use... M2 by six socket head cap screws. And it says to put a tiny amount of thread locker on there to make sure that it stays on this carriage and it doesn't vibrate loose. So we will do that. And once again, very, very little because we don't want it to embrittle our um, PC ABS parts, though with it being PC ABS, we might not have that issue anyhow. So,
sure that we're lined up. Just going to get it like just barely finger tight and call it good. I'm not going to ugga dug it down just yet. Once again, just a little dabble, do you? First two that I'd pull it up to my sixes. Need two more of these. They'll probably be up all night. Awesome. So two more here. All four in place. You see me trying to hold it with my finger. That's just to make sure that I can try and get it straight up and down and in the hole and not like drag it along the side of the part. Okay. So I've got my four on there. They're a little snug. Just going to tighten them up. Once again, these are M2 by 6 screws, so you do not want to torque them down like Bruce Almighty because you do that and you will shear the heads off of them. That is why we're using Loctite, a little bit, a tiny bit of Loctite on these. Um, and then once again, I'm going to probably pull... Yeah, I think we're good there. That's about where I'm going to get with pulling it. Um, so now what it wants us to do is put the gantry back, all the way back, and center it. Gracious. Gantry move. Why is my gantry not moving? Move, gantry. Oh, gantry's not moving because we put stoppers there to precisely prevent it from moving. That would be why it's not moving. I also move this to the side and screw this one back down in there that I was using as the end stopper. So now, hey, gantry moves. We're going to center our front piece. We're going to put this all the way back. We're going to make sure that our ends are lining up perfectly that they're bottomed out on both sides so our gantry is not racked. And then we're going to break out our phone and we're going to use an app on here called Sound Spectrum. And what Sound Spectrum is going to do is it's going to enable me to hear noise, right? So we have this all the way in the back. There should be 150 millimeters between here and here. And we're going to strum, take turns strumming each side. And that will um, you know, loosen these up too. What that will do is give us the initial sound characteristics. And we're looking for approximately 110 hertz on each side. 
We're just going to loosen these up so that we can tighten them. And once again, this side goes through this pulley, this side goes through this pulley. I'm going to be very quiet and not talk as I get this going. So I'm going to hit play. See our graph. I'm seeing it spike around 50, so I'm going to start tightening this knob. And that's about 120, so I went a little bit too far, so I'm just going to loosen the knob back up. Now it's peaking about where I want it to. Now I'm just going to rotate my phone. So my mic's on this side. I'm just going to stop it, close it out, and reopen it. Come on now. Close it out and reopen it. And that just kind of resets it because there is some ambient noise in here. So you do want to reset it a little bit. Now you see how that was real close to the 100%, so I don't need to tighten this one too much. And we're about to the same, about to the same point. So we're peaking right about here and this is the 100 and the 150 line. So peaking about right here on both sides is about good, right? So we're aiming for 110 hertz, give or take. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, so according to the manual, with the gantry pushed all the way back, we're looking at 110 hertz at 150 millimeters. And that's about standard. And what you're looking for is the measurement between the center of this pulley and the center of this pulley, which it's going around the front side. So it's the front side and this pulley, you're looking to be 150 millimeters, and then you're strumming for about 110 hertz. And believe it or not, that's the same thing you do on the gantry of any of the borons. It's the same thing you'll do on the um, nine millimeter belts for the Z-axis of uh, 2.4. What you do is you raise the gantry up so that you have 150 millimeters between the top pulley and the gantry secure point. And then you strum that and you look for 150 on all four, or excuse me, 110 megahertz on all four corners. Yeah, I know there's various tools out there. It's just making sure that they're set up right. So we've got our belts on. We just did the tensioning back here. Now that we've got it tensioned and we liked it, we need to secure all four of the bolts on the top of our motors here. And this is going to keep them from creeping over time as you know, you've got a, a high temp um, chamber. So what we're doing here is these bolts go through the top and into the motor. So we're clamping down this, this uh, red piece that's in here. 
that allows it to slide. So we're just going to try and clamp it so it doesn't slide. And these are M3 bolts, uh, button head cap screws, and they have washers underneath them. And the washers that I put on, I put with the, I'll say the bird edge down. So once again, they stamp um, washers. So you get a curved edge at the top and then a rough edge at the bottom. Put the rough edge against the plastic and that way it will, it'll provide a little additional mechanical hold. Hey, Photosmet, welcome on in, my friend. Welcome on in. Otis Mint, Maker Viking, Westry One snuck in. Hey, sis, how are you doing? Play the bass on any machine. Exactly. So, you just pluck your belts, and they're nice and good and tight, so that's good. Um, equal tension is important. Once the belt tensions are equal, trim the belt to the final length. The amount you can leave depends on the hot end you're using. If your hot end sits flush against the X carriage front face surface, um, a flush cut may be required. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut these top two belts to the same length as the other. So it's about three ribs that are visible. Um, and we'll just push them around the hot end. And if we need to later on, you know, for serviceability and maintenance, you? Um, one of the things that you can do is loosen your front um, idler mount. And you can rotate them a little bit, and then that'll give you access belt that you can then work with. You get them, you get them laid out again with the number of teeth. Rotate your your corners back in front, lock them back down, and you pretension again. So there we go. We've got our belt. We've got our carriage. Um, next up would be the print bed. We mounted that already in the last stream because we couldn't do the belts. We went ahead and did the bed. So we're just gonna kind of cruise through the bed. Now the one thing we didn't do is put in our um, cable chain because we didn't have the wires for the bed ready to go yet. So we'll get to that when we do the wiring a little bit later tonight. So we'll remember the cable chain and we'll have to mind our gap so we make sure that we've got a good length there. We put the tool head together already. And tested the tension. We've got this stuff done. We're to the part of yes we're ready to mount it so we need some m3 by 35 button head cap screws so we'll grab our our uh motor and all of its glory um and there are some uh, mounts or places on the back for zip ties. We will zip tie these, but what I wanted to do and check, in fact, let me, let me open up the Pike Obilical kit real fast. I just want to see uh, kind of roughly if I can bring my you know, which side I need to bring my hot end wires out before I zip tie anything. ADXL pie hat.
a life model decoy. Oh, sis. Yeah, so this is our mount. This is going to be facing up. And I wanted to see where the screw terminal is because this screw terminal is where the motor is going to plug in. So if I zip tie this here, mount this roughly here, I'm wondering whether or not I have the, the cable width to come around and plug in here is what I wanted to see. And I don't think I'm going to have it. So my these wires need to come around to the, I'll say the left side of the extruder or our right side when we're looking at it this direction. That was a, that was a quick and simple, let's look at this, but it will save us some grief down the road. Um, might as well just bring these packs out because we're going to get into some of them tonight. And did they have zip ties? God, I love LDL. I don't have to ever buy, oh, I should not have to ever buy zip ties because between these LDO kits and all the other printer kits I put together, I wind up with so many zip ties, it is insane. And I'm going to come in from the back side and go around the front because what that's going to enable me to do is bring this, I'll say this, the head of the zip tie flush up against the side here rather than the back. And your um, spool head is going to mount right here. So you really want to make sure that your wires are kind of off to the side and go right up the back side of your fans when you pull this tight. All right, so we got that there, and one will go on the other side over by its lonesome. But that's going to help us keep these out of the way. We'll need our M3 by 35 screws. And what I did after stream last night is all the various screws that were coming in the different, um, like the tool head box or whatever box, I just added them all in to the main box. So what I did, um, just to make it easier, LDO does not provide a kit like this in a in a Plano box, or I'm assuming this is a Plano box. This is the one from the Boron Trident kit. I just emptied everything out. I'm ignoring the top piece here, and I just laid out my screws kind of in size order to make it easier to be able to find things um, as we go through the build. These are our M3 by 35 screws. They are going to poke out the back a little bit and they're going to thread right into the plastic here. So, yeah, and I'm just going to double check. We're on page 184. So we're just going to take this and this little notch, whoops, there's a little notched groove right here, and that lines up with this notched groove right here. So that's what we're going to do is we're basically going to just take this, line it up, kind of push it down in that groove, and then we will... I have to take our belts and just kind of push them over 
put her finger in the middle and push them over some so that we can get this in there. Just like that. Grab the right screwdriver and we're going to screw these in. And there's our tool head, nice and rigidly mounted. So we've got the two M3x35s through the front. Hey, everything plus ultra, welcome on in. Sonic, I think I said hi to you once before already, just to be on the safe side, welcome in. And then we're gonna come in through the back through the back here and it says to use an M3 by 16 button head cap screw. And what this is gonna do is you're gonna have two from the front, one from the back, and it's just gonna provide a good rigid clamp right there so that your tool head doesn't rock, you know, like this on that X gantry. And this is going into the um this goes into the M3 X nut that we super glued in if you guys remember that so that's what's capturing that nut is that M3 uh, hex nut that we, or that screw, that M3 hex nut put in. Now we're not gonna follow this page because we need to add our pico bilical, which is a slightly different mount. So let me grab those parts. So let me do a little bit of cleanup to get the rest of the, um, there's a printed um, support piece here. And this piece right here is a printed support piece that needs to come off. So let me clean these up real fast. Meanwhile, we will come over here and we'll change our window view. And we're going to come over here to do the LDO Pico Bilical. What we'll try and do is get this interface layer off here um, out of the channel, preferably without slicing my finger off. Oh, or snapping my knife blade off because that's always good too.
So did I see shenanigans in here earlier? And if I did, is shenanigans working on his Ender XY stuff or is it? Or are you needing to wait until you talk to the vendor about the uh, state of the shipping? The shenanigans got his Ender XY kit in. And to say their shipping leaves a little bit to, to be desired. as far as the quality of the packing. There we go. Off a little bit easier. Yeah, just clean that part up just a little bit and then really LDO with the build. Okay. So we got the bottom part cleared out and we need to we'll have these two little angled spacers that we'll need. And we need to Take off this piece, which is just a um, port layer. Let's see if we can do that without snapping off the blade of the knife and cutting myself, because this is fairly well welded on there. I mean, I also don't want to break the part trying to get this off. Hearing that little crack scared me. Like, no, don't break the part. But that's been removed now, too. I can imagine uh, Ram Online. It was, it was weird. It was. 50 degrees this morning, and it was like 80 degrees mid-afternoon, and it's already back down to 69. So, we'll also have the frame mount, um, this right here. We'll get to that part. Go ahead, PCB assembly. Um, follow the boron manual until you get to the print head strain relief, which is where we were at. Both these parts will be replaced by the Pico Bilical PCB and matching metals, metal, oh, metal spacers. These spacers right here that we already put on the tool head, they're, uh, they're just a knurled aluminum spacer versus the printed one, which is every time I did the printed one and then I put the heat set inserts in it, I would break the, uh, the printed, um, Spacers drive me insane. So, onto the M310 screws that are holding the motor on, we're going to mount these two spacers, which we did last stream. Now, we're going to take our main pico bilical body here, and it's just going to sit on there. 
and we're going to attach it at the bottom with two M3 by 8 button head cap screws. So once again, this is just going to sit like that. Line that up and screw in the bottom two. Get them snug. Okay. Um. The hole on top of the strain relief right here is for a heat set um, insert. However, it's currently not used for anything, so we're not going to worry about putting a heat set in there for the time being. Then we're going to take our Pico Bilical board and it's going to mount right in here. And the, the board's got a little divot in it, and that's going to align right underneath here. So there, that divot's going to line up and just kind of key that in. Right? It holds in there nicely. And then we're going to use M3 by 12s and those tiny spacers that we had. And those, so if you can tell, this board is angled back. So we're going to use those angled spacers to give us a solid flat mounting surface for these screws so that we're screwing straight in as opposed to an angle, which means the angled face is going to go against the board here. And the flat side of this little spacer is going to go on the screw head. Going to try and hold that in place so it doesn't rotate around. So we're going through this little angled spacer, the PCB, this piece, and into that knurled nut on the other side. Really a cool concept. Again, just snugging it up. We're not breaking down on it. We don't need to split our umbilical board. Um, and there we go. Got our board in place. Um, next up, oh, well, the assembly is complete. Yay. Um, next, follow the manual and tell the electronics and wiring. We can go ahead and wire this section up. What I'm going to do is flip the heads off of my zip ties, not the heads off, but tails off from around the heads of my zip tie. Make sure I'm not getting any other wires in there in the process. Um, and what I'm gonna do I'm just going to lay this down here. That. Okay. See if I can't get you guys in here somewhat close. 
is where I really need a close up camera. Boy, I'm just going to try and get you guys as close as I can. Action. Um, because we just start plugging things in, right? So this is a PCS, so this is a part cooling thing. So we need to know which is which on here. I tell you guys that uh, I need to have uh, cataract surgery. This is the part cooling fan on this side. So this is going to come around and connect to this. Um, yeah, that thing. There we go. Um, then we're going to have our motor over on this side. So let's see. Be the best way for this to come down and around plug in I can hold off on doing that for just um the this is the HEF so the hot end fan that is there's three across the top it's the one on the right let's start off by doing the uh we'll come in here and do our Break out the. Oh, I fix it. Um, yeah, we're just kind of work from the bottom up and around, make life a little bit easier for ourselves. Here to here to try to not heat up before it. 18 inside. I think you're going to build a boron. Yeah, I'll tell you, my um, my borons do help keep this room toasty. They do that. So we're just getting a thinner head screwdriver so that we can get into these tiny, tiny screws. And we're just going to back these out. And once again, there's no polarity on the hot end, so it's just getting our wires in place. So bring the first one over. Get it to go. Up even more. This is going to get. There we go. So we're going to get that in there. Kind of hold it in with a little bit of pressure with our finger and tighten it down. Give it the tug test. That's good. That one up. Bring it around. Get that one in there. Apply a little forward pressure. Tighten that one down, give it a little tug. And those are now good. Put the tool back away so that it's where we expect it to be the next time we go to use it. Okay, and then once again, we're gonna sort of start in the middle. We got the hot end fan on the right hand side. Then the other part pulling fan. This goes vertical there. Then we got an X end stop and the thermistor is way over on the other side. Now we don't have an X end stop, um, that pen is going to be left unpopulated. So we've got our thermistor, unpopulated, hot end fan, 
right side cooling fan, left side cooling fan. We've got our wires for our heater. And then our motor needs to come around here and plug into the back. And then there's a little connector right here on this side. Here, let me bring you guys over so this might help to visualize. Okay, so this is the left side, or I guess the right side part cooling fan, the thermistor, the blank is the X in stop, hot end fan. The other part cooling fan, the motor, and then there's our connection for our, our hot end power. All right, and we'll tidy these wires up a little bit. This little connection right here where my finger is at is for the ADXL sensor, and we can plug that in here and run our ADXL and then unplug it when we're done. And then, of course, our 14 pin connector will plug into the top here. This board makes it really, really nice because I can take just one screw out at the back there and the two out of the front, and this whole tool head comes off, and I can take it over the bench and work on it. And that, I cannot stress how nice of a feature that is from a um, quality of life issue, right? So our tool head is wired up. Once we get everything wired up and we function check it, we'll, we'll tidy these up a little bit just by adding some additional zip ties like to the, um, around the knurled nuts here, just to kind of hold them a little bit tighter together just like that to keep them out of the way. All right. Yeah, we'll add, we'll add some additional zip ties on the, uh, across these knurled spacers just to keep these out of the way, make them a little bit tidier. And where are we at now? What's next? Our build notes it said to wait to do wiring, but we just did that wiring. Um, all right, we'll hold off on the PCB frame cover just a second. Other notes here. All right, and we're gonna start getting done with this, we're done with that. We're into electronics and wiring. Who wants to do some wiring tonight? You guys wanna do wiring or just call it a stream? I'm kidding, we've been going for what, an hour and a half? Of course we're gonna do some wiring tonight. So we're going to start by adding in our back panel. We're going to belay that. We're not going to do the back panel just yet because I want to be able to get in this thing fully right here to do the cable chain for the bed. So we need to do the bed wiring first. So we will need to figure some of that out before we go too much further. Okay. Um, that, there's that. Electronics and wiring. Copy that.
Sorry, folks, bear with me. There we go. We just need to kind of route our bed cables before we get ourselves in a bind. Um, so we've already installed the Z in stop cable. We're going to need the main power cable. That's the main power cable. Let's be free for the pipe umbilical. We've got our bed heater wires here. And we've got a label on one side that says bed heat. This is going to be on the board side, which means the other side, which isn't labeled, would be the ones that we're going to snake through our cable chain and attach to the back here. And then we're also going to need. Is the and I like how they do this. So the one side has the connector on it. The other side, it has the crimped wires. So it's got the terminals already crimped, right? But it doesn't have the connector on it. And that's because it's easier to get the wires into the cable chain without the connector on it. But this is for your bed thermistor. So these are the wires that we're going to need for that. We're also going to have one other cable, and that is a three-wire cable right here. It's not labeled, but it does have, you know, it's all black cable, but we have a white wire. Is that a red wire? A black wire. So this is going to be for our RGB to the front up here. So what we're going to need to do, doubt if I'm going to be able to get in there with the bed on. So I'm going to have to pop the bed off, which will be a little bit of a pain in the toughest, but we'll get there. I'm just going to pull that up, apply a little bit of pressure so I can undo my screws. And I don't need to take it completely off. I just kind of need to lift it up so that I can get to the connector on the board. So let me bring you guys in here real fast. So we've got a PC based. Um, board in here and you see that connector right next between the screw and the spring that's all we need to plug into to get our front LED set up so I don't need to take the bed off I just need to lift it up enough that I can get the three pin connector on there figure out which way it goes on That on, get this one lined back up. Oh, lost a spring. That one's in there, that one's in there. This one, I just lost the spring, so. Spring back in there. And just like that, they're all lined back up again. Just gonna apply a little bit of pressure. I'm not gonna put the springs or the uh, things on all the way. Wait, easier access? Um, Yeah. 
there is a lot about this build that's just creature comforts. So, and I'll show you in just a second what I mean by that. So to get the bed off, it's the three screws and the bed lifts off and underneath here, um, we'll have just a couple of All right, well, I'll show you. Let's just show you. Take this back off again. And you'll see that our bed is kind of connected, but that's because we've got on the bottom side, we've got um, Wago connectors. So it's connected in via Wagos at the bottom on this printed piece right here that you can barely see. So there's a printed piece with Wago connectors on the underside. So what I need to do is just get these wires running through this cable trough real fast. Like that. And I can put my beds and springs back on. But there are a lot of, I'll say, little creature comforts like this where it just makes this easier to work on. And especially when it comes time to actually doing any maintenance. So we've got a Bring you guys in here a little closer. We've got this little cable trough right here that we just snake these three cables in for our um, LED light. And then if I set this on the side, sorry about the video, you can just see the Wago connectors down there. So by moving the bed all the way up, I can get to my Wago connectors to put in my, the, the two leads for my bed, and then connect right above that white connector, there's another JST for the thermistor, and then all my connections are made, and I can just loop it around here. So it makes it a lot easier. I just realized we've got an ad break going. Perfect timing. Okay, ad break is over. Um, so what I was showing you is we have our Wago connectors down here and our JST for our thermistor cable. So it just makes life easier. So we can take the bed off just by flipping it on its side, popping out you know, two Wago levers and pulling a JST and I can take the bed off and get it out for whatever maintenance I need to do. And now what I need to do is get this cable through our cable chain. Now I've got the bed, we'll say all the way up, and I wanna make sure that my cable chain is gonna be good. I'm just gonna kind of lay this in here, maybe. Work with me, there we go. Lay that in there, bring that down. I'll actually go the other way. That there, 
this around to there. And what we're needing to do is just make sure that this doesn't um so I'm laying my cable chain in here and just laying it in place and making sure that it doesn't go all the way up to the top where it would hit the gantry. Because if it does, if I add one more link, it will hit the gantry and it'll cause problems and it'll drive this into the back plate. And we, and we don't want that. But we should be good with this link set up right there. Well, no, we'll take one more link out. I think we'll take one more link out. Just to be on the safe side, we'll be good. And unfortunately, these are not the, um, you know, the, the kind that open because they're so small. So you need to get your links right before you actually do your full install because otherwise you'll you'll run into I don't want to say issues but it'll just be a little more painful yeah I like that that'll work um so this is the top this is the bottom and we need to get our oh, here we go we need to get our thermistor wire through here and it's the first one I'm going to do so I'm actually going to start at the bottom and use the key head to push through there because it should be oh no it's not going to fit I was going to say it should be a tight fit but it should fit and it's not so I do have to start at the top and go down through the bottom with my um, pieces here. and we're just going to feed it down through there and get through, pull it around. We're going to do the same thing with our hot end heater cables. Um, we're going to try and snake these in here now and walk them through. Wire chip. Got our heater cables now and our thermistor cables, but we're also going to need our LED cables to push through. Um, so, push these through now. So, without uh, ramming any of the others through along the way. This is where it starts to get a little more, I don't want to say complicated, just a little more painful as we're trying to get more and more wires through this little um, cable chain. This is where it'd be nice if you just open it up, lay it in there, and then close it down. Oops. One that went. Almost there. Work with. There we go. And two and three. So we've got all of our cables now run through here. We'll need to
lay this through here. We'll get our wires connected up. I'm going to start with our JST connector. That'll probably be the easiest. We got the JST. Now we'll need our bed thermistor wires. Or not thermistor. Uh, we just did the thermistor. Uh, bed heater wires. And you don't really have them labeled, which is a bit painful. So I want to So the reason I'm worried about this is I want to get the right one going in. So the, the positive, the, the red side, the side that's plugged into the positive, I want to go in and go through the, the, um, the ceramic fuse first, and then the return will come through the bed. Right, because that way, if if the fuse breaks, it stops the inbound current. Where if, if it's on the outbound leg, it's it could still let power come all the way into the fuse, and I want it to stop before it gets in there. And these are going to connect on the inside of these two legos. So we're just going to get one in here. And hey, Chris, how's it going, my friend? I just saw you sneak in here. Ah, uh, this is where we start getting small printer, big hand syndrome. Okay, so those are in there. Now what we're going to want to do is make sure that our cables come through the gap in our bottom plate here. We're just gonna route those through here. And we'll connect in the bottom of our cable chain. It'd be easier said than done apparently. Careful not to crimp your wires. There we go. And then the top, pull some slack through, is gonna it's gonna go up and around and back down through this front side. So our cables are gonna come down the trough this way. this down. Give me a little bit more room to work with. So Chris, did you remember to bring home some smaller screws for your frame? I'm going to try and hound you so that you can get it ready and have it all ready for the stream. One wire wants to be a booger and not stay in the little cable trough there. A couple of them do. 
wind up popping that bed off a little bit. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to slowly pull this excess through. Is this T? Do this T. That would be wise because the VST is like wrapped around the others. The other joy of running cables and cable chain is just they tend to wrap around each other in the cable chain, getting out through there. So. Extra cable back down there. I'm going to pull that on. There we go. There's a spot, I think, for a cable tie right there. So we'll try and get a cable tie in to hold those cables in the trough and to hold all of these cables kind of together right there. There we go. Our cables through there. Sorry about that, folks. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Welcome on in. For those of you that don't know, Chris made it around the sun one more time this year. So uh, he had a birthday yesterday, I believe. So definitely need to have a uh, shout out for Chris. If anybody that can do that. Oh, hey, my mod is Chris. So Chris, give yourself a shout out. For your birthday, if you don't mind. Oh. Joys of cable management. Probably. That should work. Might just put one around the wires right there. All the wires themselves.
So we're pretty much getting there, Chris. We're like right at the part where we're getting ready to start doing up wiring on the underside. Just here I get the bed wired up um, and get the, the uh, cable chain run, which will be a lot easier to do now than after I put the back panel on. So we'll put that stuff there. We just have this set of wires sliding down here. Oh, do you, yeah, you don't want me to sing. I don't even do that to my family. Oh, that sucks, Turtle Crawler. You lost internet for a while? That sucks. So... We'll do that since he won't give himself a shout out. Okay, so now we're going to flip the printer onto its face gently, pulling excess cables out. And we're going to put this back panel in. And this is why we put in three different. Um, nuts in these two extrusions is so we can run our um our back panel plate so let's grab the back panel rear panel bottom real rear panel top relax that would that would be the one I'm looking for. This is the mid panel. I think everything else is going to be acrylic. I have had these sheets peel off very nicely, and then I've had them where they have just been a roaring pain in the butt. Um, so, and they and they just tear basically apart in shreds. So, in fact, I just got a couple of pretty good pulls. I'm going to take for the night. Now we've got a series of holes in here so we need to match it up so these holes are at the bottom okay that's good but these holes go on the side towards me so let's flip it over like that and that's how we're going to align it so it looks like our preload nuts are going to be at the top the bottom and sort of in the middle so i'm going to go ahead and just work to move these sort of close to where they're going to go And then we'll work them around from there. And this is just going to slide right through. And like I said, I'm going to I'm going to work on getting these refined as I come to them. So a little bit further, a little bit further down, and further up.
And I kind of mark one, eyeball them. That's at least close enough that I can then use my tweezers to definitely get them in the right place. And just like that. So we got that slit in there. We've got our screws or our no drop nuts lined up and we're just making sure that it's flush at the top and bottom. Yeah, so Chris, get me uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can do both acrylic and polycarbonate panels, right? We're gonna use our M3 by six button head cap screws here. Um, I'm just going to get them started. I'm not going to tighten them all the way down just yet because I want to make sure that I'm, I didn't ship the panel out of whack any. So I want a little bit of movement. And these are slots so that the, um, you know, the panel can still move side to side a little bit. I'm just going to make sure that I'm good. I'm going to apply a little bit of pressure so that the panel doesn't move. I'm going to lock the panel in a you know, crossing motion so it doesn't rack on me. Right, we're good there. Now it talks about doing the wiring prep. And I've got some more notes. It says, this talks about using the den cleats. It says the stock den cleats and mounts will not work for the Raspberry Pi Zero 2W plus USB expansion board. This it will be too tall for the back panel to close. LDO recommends the following two options. Uh, use VHB with the expander mount and use the stock mount for the SKR Pico. Um, RPI Zero mount will use two M2 by 10 self-tapping screws. Opposite side of the standoff will screw directly into the plastic, not over Satan. Okay, let me. Let me grab my electronics pieces here so we can kind of decipher what they're talking about. Yep, nope, nope. So this looks like it's for the SKR. 
actually doesn't look like the SKR Pico either. That actually looks like the SKR Mini E3 V3. So I may have printed all of the wrong mounting bracket. That sucks. And clip and clip. All right, we might be that close. Is the two screw mounted? Because I don't have one of, whoops, I just realized we're looking at the wrong screen. So that's why you guys are popping. No idea what you're talking about. Okay, you do acrylic, but you can also do ACM and PC panels. ACM and PC are milled. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. So you laser cut the acrylic, but you mill your ACM, which makes sense, and your PC. Okay. Um. Trying to think if I happen to have one of those spare printed out, and I'm not seeing one. So we're going to need to get that printed out because honestly, this which was on the plates to print. This doesn't look like a Raspberry Pi mount, and the SKR Pico mounts at the same as a Pi. So I'm kind of confused a bit. Because see, you've got the Pico and then a Raspberry Pi, and they're both should be using the same mounts. Now, they talk about having a separate weird mount, and it might be this one. Or a Raspberry Pi Zero with a USB expander mount. Let me check that real fast on their GitHub link. Yeah, so this is the Raspberry Pi Zero with a USB expander mounted to it, but it's a specific USB um, expander that gets mounted to it, and I don't think it came with one because it doesn't come with because they don't ship it with the Raspberry Pi I don't think it's going to come with their expander board Because this is so 
So this piece here is a little hat that will that will plug into the GPIO pins on your Raspberry Pi. And what it allows you to do is run power into it. So you run your power into the Pi, and then you'll have your ADXL that connects in through an FPC cable here. And this one, I'm not sure what the three pins for. We'll find out when we do the, uh, I guess what we can do is just look at the LDO wiring guides. Second cleat can be used for the SKR Pico and the SKR Pico mount. Both mounts use M2 by 10 self tapping screws. Cleats have three position holes to center. Recommended. Give me one second, folks. So, what I did was I used a set of pre laid out um, plates to print all these parts with. And I'm wondering if I just have, okay, so these are the Gen screw cleats. Okay. Then screw cleats, the high expansion clip. Okay. And the SKR Pico mount. So this, in this case, the Pico would mount directly to these and then be clipped on. Blame Chris for ordering a Mopa fiber laser recently. I blame Chris on a lot of things. Everybody wants a laser pecker. Okay, so. LVO wiring guide, tool head, wiring the back panel. Sorry guys, I'm just, I'm trying to look at the manual real fast. And I think what we're gonna do is instead of following the, the boron manual much further for like this stuff here, we are going to quasi jump over to the LDO wiring guide. Let me switch the screen. Hey, Tech Jeeper, how's it going? You didn't get a pecker, you ordered a 30 watt MOPA. Much more powerful, can do black marks on aluminum, color on stainless, deep etching on metals. Nice. 
Yeah, once you see a pecker, you can't go back or they say. It's always nice when your significant other likes your pecker. Just saying. Uh, so this piece right here, it talks about wiring the picobilical, which is what we've already done. We did this part right here, other than you know the ADXL port and the umbilical, which we'll do once we get everything else in place. Now it wants to talk about wiring the deck panel and preparing the AC outlet. So our AC outlet is going to wind up going right here. And we've got our AC outlet. So Oh yeah. That's true, just the advertising ability of saying, hey, you want to see my pecker? No, my laser pecker. Yeah. Okay, so there's a package with two fuses in it. Flathead screwdriver, pry your fuse out, and just make sure that there's a fuse in it because there's been times where I've gotten these and there's no fuse in it, and then you wonder why things aren't working. So fuses there, that's good. We've got spare fuses, we'll set that in the box. And we're gonna look at this and we've got blue from the bottom left to the top right, red from the bottom left to the top left, or excuse me, bottom right to the top left, and then we're going to need, yeah, we're going to need, we're going to use our cable like this. We've got our spade connectors and our fork connectors, and we're going to plug in our spade connectors. So this side is our ground. These are going to um, run this way for no other reason than the wires will line up and match up. Um, and then on the bottom, we're going to have red and blue. And next. Said red necks, not red neck. Pop that on there. See? Least possibly. I don't know why. I go with tight fitting connectors, small spaces, and big fingers. So we're going to pull that one out. And we're going to go red and blue here. I like that they get these connectors nice and, you know, tight, but damn. my finger trying to get these things pushed on. I think that was Hey, Darth Doll, thank you for the resub for four months. Appreciate it. All right, and these things are just seriously way so damn tight. Oh. <sighs> 
Still not on there. I'm actually bending the connector a little bit, trying to get this spade terminal to open up and go over it. That is crazy. What I'm going to do is just try and take the switch out, the whole little switch module itself out, do the wiring, and then slip it back in. Maybe get that to come out. Why are these things so damn hard? not be this darn difficult to get wires on here. This is insane. Oh, one, this one on here, breaking anything. The end. Ah, finally. Okay. Not moved. Before we figure out which orientation it goes in, we're going to follow our guide over here again. So our blue is on the top outside, the red is on the left top. So go in like that. Right, so blue's on the top, red's on the 
for a top right. Red's on the top left. That's how the switch goes in. There we go. And red on the bottom right of the switch side, blue on the bottom left. Our ground or to the ground. Man, that was a lot more painful than it needed to be. For the power supply, we're going to make sure that it's set to the right um, power setting. We're going to grab our more sun power supply. We're going to look at it. We're going to say no power switch because the more sun is auto sensing. So there is no switch to flick. Take a look through the top and verifying. Yep, there's no switch to flick. So, yep, more suns are auto set. And add a few strips of VHB to the underside of the 24 volt power supply and place the power supply and wire duct in the location shown while keeping in mind of these points. Be sure to leave a small gap of about 20 millimeter between the front extrusion and the deck panel. This is to provide clearance for a display. Uh, you still need to have a small gap of five millimeters between the Z motor and power supply so that the cables can be run between them. So we're gonna dump the printed parts off there because we forgot we put printed parts on there. We're going to flip this up on the top. Oh, wait, we've got a tool head there. So before we can flip that up on the top, we need a couple of boxes that we can use to provide a stable surface. Actually, those probably aren't going to be tall enough. Polymaker to the rescue. Good thing this thing is so light. One there. One there. Yeah, tool head in the middle. And just like that. We're going to take our wires and just kind of lay them towards the front edge there. We're going to kind of check placement before I go and put any VHB on this. And it says we want about 20 millimeters from the front edge. It's 20 millimeters. It says we need about five millimeters of a gap between here and we've got about seven. So that's a good placement of where we want to put this. Um, and we need to get some strips of some VHB tape. And what do we do with the VHB? Not there, not there, with the fasteners and tools. And actually, I'm going to hold off on opening this one because I'm pretty sure I have, like, I think that one hasn't been opened yet.
thought I had, oh, there it is. The HP that was open from a previous build. So we're gonna put this over. Do a quick wipe down with some isopropyl alcohol. We're just gonna get some on there gently. Wipe our fingerprints off of it. Make sure we get some good adhesion going. We're going to make it when we put this on there that it ain't ever coming off. See my scissors. We're just going to make a couple of strips. Now, the more VHP you put on here, the more it's going to stick and the less chance you're going to have of getting it off. Just throwing that out there. Um, you might need to take it off at some point. So just think ahead. Applying a little bit of downward pressure on there so that it'll stick as I try and take the uh, backing off. They're going to be more fun than I expected. All right, I did tell you guys that I'm going, I'm going to have to have cataract surgery, right? Here, went and had my eyes dilated earlier today, and he said, yep, you're going to need cataract surgery. So I may be down and out for a little bit. We'll have to see how, you know, when I can get it scheduled and how bad it impacts me. Maybe just wind up doing some chat and chill streams instead of some build while I'm recovering. Does anybody have a trick to get the uh, BHP backing off and started? Love to hear it. Finally, one of them. Okay, so we're going to kind of hold this 
a little high. Get our 20 millimeter spacing going. Okay, then. Now we're just going to apply some pressure. Okay. Yeah, it, it's a mostly safe surgery. It, it just sucks because they'll do one eye, I'll be down for a few days, and then a couple weeks later we'll go and have the other eye done. Hey Ozzy, welcome on in. Welcome on in. So we got that piece down. It basically shows us to go ahead and add about 90 millimeters of our cable trough, which is always fun. Um, there is no real easy way of cutting this that makes it not painful. I'm just going to make a couple marks. Line said marks up with my ruler. Line. That should give me a place to cut. And like I said, there is no nice or easy way that I've been able to cut this stuff without it getting just all kinds of ugly. So once again, anybody with any uh, other than, hey, take it down to the, uh, not the table saw, but the uh, band saw. Let's see if I can just score it with my hobby knife. Sheet metal snips, yeah. Unfortunately, my sheet metal snips are actually out in the garage as well. So, which might still be the best option I've got. Not too bad. That's one side. And of course, the 
other side would have to be cut in the opposite direction. Karate chop, uh-huh. Yeah, and I've heard that, you know, sheet metal snips work really well. Um, like I said, mine are just out in the shed. I kind of don't want to, or not in the shed, but in the garage, and I just kind of don't want to go deal with that just now. Okay, so we've got that. Okay, this is going fairly good. We're just going to put these down with some VHB tape. And of course, we'll have to cut the trough lids to match somewhere down the road. So we'll, we'll work on that a little bit later. Um, VHB. You don't want it right up against the power supply because you, you need a little bit of room for the um, lid to pop on. You need a little bit of a gap.
And yeah, if I had good sewing scissors, they would probably be Mrs. Dragons, and I would get in all kinds of trouble if she caught me doing them, using them on stream for cutting stuff like this. And she's been known to just sit in the background and lurk on me. Catch me saying things, so. No, KB3D has not um, broken into my network and changed any lighting schemes in the house yet. Exactly. It's good nature to a point. Yeah, well, Evil Diesel was over here today because he was my driver to the uh, to the eye appointment. So he was here today. All righty. So we've got that laid out. Now we're going to insert our inlet. And I like to insert my inlets so that the O or off is down. I want to be able to reach around the back and go down in a downward motion to shut the power off. Since we're upside down, that O for off needs to be facing up because this is the foot, this is the bottom. So that is the direction that we're going to put our socket in. Of course, it's going to be tight fit. There we go. That's a nice solid snap. I'm not sure if you guys heard that or not, but. And all of our power connections are these first three ones here. We grab a screwdriver driver off the board. And we're going to need our line or L is our red. We're going to grab our red spade connector. Flip it on there. And screw that down. That's our load. Next one is our neutral, which is our blue wire. that in there. Make sure it's fully seated and tighten that down. And then of course the next one is the ground. Fully seated. Nugget and downward pressure and really get it nice and tight. So now we get to play with our wires a little bit and see if we can't kind of try and get them to where they're down behind the groove there because you're going to have your skirts here and you're going to need that spacing to be able to um, get your access. So get down in there. Forward, one back. There we go. There we go. Probably go one more. Yep. Nope. That's the one. Down there in your cable trough. 
So that I try and get this just pushed down um, by the groove so that it would be out of the way when we go to put in our skirts. Next up, uh, check your work, comparing the picture, make sure that your, your colors are matching. Red, blue, yellow, green. We got here. I think I'm gonna ask if it worked. Better dull the tips when you mess them up. Oh yeah. Um. Now I know it works. Give me, a, give me I gives me ideas. I want to have a blunt object in that case. Exactly. Exactly. Blunt objects means jagged lines. And and sharp objects. At least it'll cut deep, but it'll be a nice cut. Easier to sew things back up that way. Okay. So we got our plug in. Before moving on to the next step, let's check the mains wiring. The mains wiring is plugged. We've got that done nicely. Um, oh, and it wants us to do our first power check to make sure that our um, thing plug or uh turns on with no issues. Ah, ah, of course. So Plugs in. We're going to do our first little spark test. So power is going on. One, two, three. Everything powers on. We have a light here. Now, one of the things that you can do, and I would probably suggest doing right now before you get any further or plug anything in, grab your multimeter. And let's check and see that we've actually got 24 volt and not a little less or a little more. So we're just going to get this plugged in. Pop the ends of our leads off. We're going to go to, where are we going to go to? Yeah, so positive to positive, negative to negative. And I've got 23.9. So I'm, I'm good, but I'm a little bit light. So what I can do very, very carefully and preferably not using the metal screwdriver that I'm gonna be using, you should have, um, you can get these screwdrivers in uh, plastic or ceramic, but there's a potentiometer right here next to the light. So put your screwdriver on that plastic potentiometer and just turn it one way and you'll be able to quickly tell whether it's that's dropping the current. So I'm going to go the other way. Not going to take much. But what I want to do is bring it right to 24 volts. And there we are, we're at 24 volts even. Move your leads away from each other. Turn off your multimeter. 
and now you've got it set. There has been times, like the more suns, the mean wells, they're pretty much like right there. This was 23.9. I really didn't need to adjust it, but I have had some, I don't know, like the, uh, the not well BS531-8008. Um, you might want to check and make sure that's given out a solid five volts and not set it like 4.3 volts or something, you know? Um, so if, if you're using, I'll say a non name brand, you know, Hey, I bought this off AliExpress. It says mean well, but the, um, the, um, uh, Oh, the the brand logo looks a little different. It probably is. You've probably got a knockoff. It might be worth taking five seconds to break out the multimeter to make sure it's delivering the right voltage. Because it's not it's not like it's gonna hurt you to, to double check or triple check the voltage that's being supplied. Right? Okay. So we did a check, we made sure that nothing blew up. Um, now it says to finish off the below deck wiring. And what that means is we need to run some more wiring through here. Now we've got a bunch of cables coming here and this is our heater bed, the bed RGB and the bed thermistor. And what it tells us to do is just bring it around and loop it into our cable trough. Right, and then bring it back up by the motor. So all we're doing is just taking up some of the slack, bringing it up by the motor. This is our end stop, and the end stop pretty much just goes forward like that, okay? So there's our wiring coming from the under deck. We do need a couple of other wires, and that is the wire to the main PCB. This is the wire to main PCB. And this side says 24 volt N. So we're going to. Awesome. So this wire gets plugged in over here. We're going to go positive to positive, negative to negative, which is positive on the left, negative on the right. They've got these crimp connectors on upside down. Of course. That one goes there. This one goes there. And then this wire is going to just be brought around. It's going to go up there. Once again, just try and keep it out of the way of your skirt. Oh, there you go, Nick. Nick. Yeah, that's why you always double check is because it could be set under, it could be set over. And if it's set over, like on the Raspberry Pi, if you're plugging it in, like if you just cut the end of a USB cable, which I sort of highly suggest because that way you're coming in through the USB, um, it's voltage protected. When you plug into the GPIO, if you're under or over voltage, you could have issues. And normally, like on a Pico, when you connect in a Raspberry Pi from the Pico, it provides 
two positive lines. So it goes to the two positive five volt N and then the negative and then the two UART, the transmit and receive. Um, I have found when I just go into one of the five volt N, the ground, the UARTs, um, sometimes I will get some inconsistent readings and pulling another five volt line, it gets rock solid and I have no issues with the tie. I think it just has one way of showing an error um, and that's just the way it's coded. So this is going to the PCB. We've got another line that will be to the picobilical. This had the ZN stop cable, the heat pad extension cable, the heat pad thermistor, the inlet for the PSU, the PSU to SKR cable, and the nylon sleeve. So this cable pack is done with. The cable that goes up to the picobilical is probably going to be in the picobilical bag. And there will be another. Um, so what we do is we actually bring 24 volt to the SKR. And then for whatever reason, we take 24 volt to the picobilical. Well, I know I do it there because that applies power to everything at the tool head. And we, we have a converter, a uh, buck converter built into the picobilical. So we're going to take 24 to the picobilical board that mounts up here between the motors. And then we're going to come off of that with five volts back to the Raspberry Pi. Oops, almost my light. It's KB3D underscore Chris. So same thing here. We just need to unscrew the other two available terminals. Positive one. Get the positive end. So the issue I'm having is, you know, there's there's the wording, and the way that it goes in there, it's positive on the left, negative on the right. But the way they did the connectors, if I put it down like that, the forks don't go all the way. Whoops forks don't go all the way in, right? So I have to put them this way where the, where the um, fork is on the bottom, which means I now have to do the crossing thing on these cables, which is just annoying. Either that or I guess I could theoretically, if I wanted to cut the forks off and redo them, but I'm not gonna do that. I'll just complain about it. And the other thing that I don't necessarily like is it says two umbilical here at the board, which makes sense. But the other side, it could say like 24 volt to umbilical. So that you make sure and you plug your, your umbilical end to the umbilical and the other one in to the other board or the uh, into your SKR. I mean, I guess the there are different links, which should hopefully, you know, you should hopefully uh, figure that out. Okay. So we've got those two in place. Pay close attention to the polarity of the 24 volt cables. Incorrect polarity can damage your PCB. Compare your work with the close up shown below. Should have red cable, red cable, black cable, black cable. And that is what we have. Um, once you're done, you can cut the covers and put your wire duct cover on. So I'll just kind of make a couple of relative marks.
Hey, Evil Diesel. How's it going, dude? Have your ears been burning? Because we've been talking all kinds of shit about you. I mean, we, we've been talking, saying nice things about you. All good. It probably is true, yeah. So thanks for stopping in, Evil Diesel. We've been, uh, we're just doing a little bit of work here on our um, wiring. Well, we, we got to the point where we're at the wiring now. So that's good. Starting to make some progress on said wiring. goes there and this one here Oh, you just clean up these edges real fast. Read off of this. Sorry, guys, I know I'm doing this off camera, but it's just I was just filing the edges to make them less prone to cutting a cutting a cable. Um I don't think it was that um, enticing. Just slide that on. We've got our nice wire cable troughs going. Next, we're going to go to the back panel and we're going to prepare our SKR Pico. So I think we're good for this side now, so we can remove our stands carefully. We're now going to sit it on the face. <laughs> Sorry, folks. So we have access to our back area here where all of our cabling's coming. It says to prepare the SKR Pico. Um, it has the same hold pattern as a full Raspberry Pi. We used a printed Raspberry Pi mount on the Pico. Use extensionless homing on the XY axis. As such, we need to add a jumper on the X-Diag and Y-Diag headers 
that are shown down here on the board. We'll take our Pico out. We'll keep dumping cables off to the side. And by the way, manufacturers need to do this more often. This is a full wiring schematic. I wish I could focus on. But this would be great. I print these out or I pull them up on the web page. But this is great. Now, granted, I might be able to read those. And if I need to, I can pull up the phone and just magnify it a bit. Um, so we're going to open up our package here. And we're going to have plenty of jumpers. And there's our little SKR Pico. I love these little boards. All right, so we need to apply a couple of diag pins because, once again, the X and the Y we're going to use sensorless homing on. Grab a couple of the pins, a couple of the pins, a couple of the jumpers. rest of the jumpers and the screws back in there. Set that aside. Um, now the one thing, this this is a got you, and I'll see if I can show it on this, if it will, come on. You can do it. Focus. Might just be back. You know, white on black is possible. So anyhow, the first stepper here is E. This is your extruder. Then it's X. Then it's Y. Then it's Z. Okay. So that means that our jumpers, which are right underneath here, this is X. Excuse me. This is E for the extruder. X, Y and Z, which means we need to put jumpers on these two sets of pins. So we're setting the diag pin for the X and the Y. Oh yeah, this board is awesome, and it's the same size as a Raspberry Pi, so you can mount this either on top of the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi on top of this, or what I've done is I use a Raspberry Pi Zero because it can mount right over here. I make sure and run my, my air right over this channel. So it's going over the heat sink and over the Raspberry Pi itself. And that leaves access to everything over here. Great little boards. This, is, this was a great board design that they came up with. Okay, so we got our diag pin set. Turn the Raspberry Pi. So this setup that you're seeing here, um, you know, let me let me do this. Actually, change this to that. Okay, it makes this a little bit bigger. Um, so, on the preparing the Pico board, or excuse me, the Raspberry Pi board, what you're seeing here is a Raspberry Pi Zero or Zero Two W sitting on top of a. Um, uh, a daughter board that has the USB hub on it. So that gives you your USB connection. Oh, hey, Chris, take it easy, my friend. Thanks for being here. Um, I don't 
I, I've got a Raspberry Pi Zero. I got a Raspberry Pi 2W around here as well. Here's that other little daughter board that you'll see right here. Whoops, you'll see. Darn it. Once again, that's the little daughter board that you're seeing. And you've got the power in that goes to the five volt and the ground. And you've got your ADXL um, cable that would come out of here. And I can't remember what goes in to the three pin here um, off the top of my head. It's not actually labeled on here, but I'm sure it'll tell us somewhere um, when we go to use it. I don't have one of these boards. Um, I've got a USB expander, but it's not that same design. So similar type of thing, this would go this would sit on the Raspberry Pi and provide pass through GPIOs. So this would sit on top of the Raspberry Pi rather than the Raspberry Pi sitting on top. Um, so it's doable. I mean, it gives us the three outputs and an ethernet. I can look for one of those hubs and see if I can't find one and get it shipped real fast. Um, and we'll set it up basically the same way that they're calling to do it. Um, but I'm just not going to be able to do that side of it just yet. We'll have to see if I can get it in by Sunday or by Saturday. My bad. Yeah, we got a pretty awesome game shop nearby. Um, eventually, I'm going to go on game night and take my Warhammer helmet that's sitting right behind me, the, the Warhammer uh, Space Marine Chaplain's helmet. Um, but yeah, so that the Raspberry Pi setup we will do. Um, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to have to order that uh, USB extension board so that we can mount it and run it just like it shows here in the LDO wiring guide. That would be helpful if I show you guys. So I will um, get what I need to set it up like this, um, hopefully between now and Saturday. We got an ad break, so second. Yeah, we've got to figure something out there, Evil. Okay, so as I was saying, um, I I will buy one of these port or the uh, USB extender boards here so that we can set this up, but we'll probably won't do this until Saturday because I'm going to have to actually search for one of these online and get it ordered. Hopefully I can get it off Amazon and get it here quickly. If not, then we'll figure something out. Cool, cool, my light. I'm glad. So preparing the Pico Billical. So the Pico Bilical frame PC has an RPI 2040 in it. So, whoops, that one. This one. Um, and it should be reflashed with Clipper firmware. If it was not flashed or needs to be reflashed, the newer firmware, check here. So we will have the ability to check this stuff out and reflash it but 
here is said board. This board is going to mount, um, get these cables down here. And, okay. So if you remember, we put in these heat set inserts right here and right here. So this board on these little ears is going to mount up underneath that. Big connector is going to the top. So it's going to mount underneath it like this. And all of our board connections are down here. And then we just have the 14 pin going up to our pike umbilical. Okay. So this is really, really nice. Um, and once again, it's got the pin out silk screen at the top of what GPIO pin goes where. So that's really nice. And once again, on the other, on the underside, you're going to have USB-C power. Um, 24 volt and ground. I believe this is the input. And this is the 5 volt out that's going to go over and power the Raspberry Pi. Um, this will be the E motor. So you'll have a jumper that'll go from this down to the SKR Mini. And basically, most of the jumpers here are coming from the 14 pin back down to the SKR Mini. This is going to be a cool little thing. And you use the USB C here to talk back to their RPI because once again, this is another MCU. Okay. And it does come, and this is so cute. I'll lose this. With a seven amp fuse. So you do have the fuse that you can replace. As I find it. So you do have the ceramic fuse that you can replace there if you ever blow the fuse. Uh, yeah, mod light, that's going to be, that was funny. And then we've got a jumper here. I'm not sure what the jumper's for, but I'm sure it'll tell us. So install the fan voltage jumpers corresponding to the rated voltage of your hot end fan and your part cooling fan. In the photo shown below, the hot end fan is set to five volt, where the part fan is set to 24 volt. These kits come with a 24 volt hot end fan. To so set the hot end fan to 24 volt, please double check the sticker on the fan to make sure you have a 24 volt fan, otherwise it will damage it. Um, I didn't double check folks and it's already installed. So you know what that means, right? And interestingly enough, so it's these jumpers over here and both the jumpers on my board are set on the right, so the middle and the right pin, which is five volt. And they should be 24 volts. So I need to move both these pins over to where they're on the left and the center. To set the fans to 24 volt. Okay. Um, note the two pin header circled in red. It should not be populated with the jumper unless you need to flash the board using the UF2 bootloader mode. That would be these pins right here next to the um, next to USB-C connector. So. So the PCB placement, it shows us how to place our PCBs. 
We can go ahead and mount this one and the center trough. We won't be able to do our Raspberry Pi yet because we will have to work on that. Um, and we need to get things mounted up. It actually tell us how to It didn't actually talk about putting it on the board, but the way these um, clips work is one on each side of the board, and then you'll be able to den clip these. Now, I'm trying to see because it doesn't show. It'd be great if it showed which side the uh, it would mount. It's probably going to go like that. It's weird. Is it me or does this picture look like there's no ding clips there? Hey, Pretty Brit. How's it going? Yeah, that Dragon Den guy, he's pretty cool. Yeah, so I think how this would work is these um so these parts here would would mount on through these um holes and these become the den clips right so your your den rail will flip on one side snap on the other and there's how it mounts um, and then you can pull it back off. So these would mount through these through holes where we where we put the uh, screws at. What I'm looking at is I think we have to use one. We're gonna have to use longer screws, and then two. We're gonna need to use. Dock den cleats and mount will not work with the Raspberry Pi Zero 2W plus USB expansion board since it'll be too tall for the back panel to close. LDO recommends the following two options. Use the screw mounted den cleat. In screw cleat times two, which are these with the high extension clips, not with a second cleat to be used for the SKR Pico with the SKR Pico out. Both of these use M2 by 10 self tap screws. Cleats have three position holes. The center hole is recommended, but there will not be enough space for the cable raceway ducts with this option. Yeah, so it recommends using the center holes, but if you use the center holes, when you mount it, 
then you won't have room for the cable raceway in the middle. So if we mount it to the left holes, you know, the, the inside hole on each side, um, we should have enough room that we can still use the raceway duck in the middle. And then when we when we get the Raspberry Pi extender or the uh when we get the uh USB extender for the Raspberry Pi Zero, it'll mount onto this board. So the, the extender will mount here, the Raspberry Pi goes on top, and then they suggest just doing BHB tape and BHBing this down, which should still give us room for the cable truck. So that's how we're going to do that. Um, I will just need to pop these out and use some M3 by 10 screws, I believe it said. Didn't say screws to use. Those were M3 by six. And if I go by 10, they're four millimeters thicker. And about how thick is this piece? About four millimeters, that should work. Um, got a mess going on here. These two screws out. Them away. Oh, are you under the weather, Creatix Brit? I'm sorry. So the kiddos wound up getting you sick. So I know the kiddos were sick the other night. Yeah, that, that really sucks. So, then three by 10 screw through, and I'll get that lined up with the bottom one. Screw that down, grab another M3 by 10 and do the other one. And that would give us our DIN rail mount. For this side. And then what I want to do is kind of see which way it offsets. And about where it would line up and what I'll be able to get. And I believe that's going to be the right way. So I'm going to need some M2 by 10 self tapping screws. Fuck. Well, that sucks. I hope you feel better soon, Britt. We grab our 1.5 driver for these. And once again, these are just self-tapping into the plastic. Line up the holes. We get the first one started, but not all the way cranked down. We'll get the other one going. And we'll crank them down.
that proper alignment. And if you look, that's why they've got that little recess piece is because that way it doesn't interfere with any of the solder joints underneath it. And I want you to see this, this plug right here is the one that this connector would fit into. And what it does is it provides two five volt power, ground, and then your transmit receive UART pins. And this would normally plug into your Raspberry Pi. So if you stacked your Raspberry Pi right on top of it, this would come around, plug into the GPIOs to provide power and you would talk UART between these two. We're not gonna use that for this particular installation because of the way they have it laid out, but that is how you would use it. And it works really well. It really does. Um, in fact, the Rook 2020 is running that setup right now with a um, not the Pico umbilical, but a standard V0 umbilical setup. So. I'm not going to add the Pi just now um, because the Raspberry Pi setup that they call out for um, would be a like a V0 or excuse me, a uh, Raspberry Pi 0 or, or 02W. And it utilizes a USB. Um, uh, expanders so let me let me jump over to this window okay so the raspberry pi is like you see here in this up here so you have this four port usb expander sits on the bottom and your raspberry pi zero mounts directly to it and it connects via the pogo pins. If you're not familiar with pogo pins, um, whoops, over here. So these little gold pads are pogo pad and you basically on the daughter board that would mount underneath it you would have a spring um uh like pole that you would when you mount it in that that spring pole gets compressed and it provides a friction fit to that pad and you can pass electricity through it so that's how that sets up so I do have a Raspberry Pi Zero. That's not the problem. Um, I do have this little adapter board that it shows. Let me switch back over here. So I do have a Raspberry Pi Zero. I do have this little adapter board that it shows here. Um, but I... You get the right window, sorry. Okay, a little bit bigger here. So I've got a Raspberry Pi Zero. I've got this little adapter board that I'm, I'm running the mouse around right now. And this little adapter board provides the five volt input at the top through the screw terminals. And this little white connector at the bottom is the ADXL connector. So it does have an ADXL that we can run input shaper and stuff on. So what we don't have is we don't have the USB plate because LVO has stopped shipping pies with their kits just because they're too expensive or they have been and they haven't started back up with providing them. So 
I'm, I'm going to go out and try and source one of those. I have a port extender or a, yeah, port extender, but it's not the same kind. So it won't use the mount that they have provided in the kit. Mine goes on top of the Raspberry Pi versus the other way around. So I will try and, and source one of these um, four port USB extender boards. So, and this is the Pico Bilical board. So once again, this is going to mount right like this, so that the only connectors sitting up are these two connectors. 14 pin goes straight to the tool head. I'm not sure what this other is. I, I think it might be for maybe NeoPixels. We'll see. Um, but this board as a whole runs off of a Raspberry Pi 2040 chip. So this is an MCU in and of itself. So we're going to bring 24 volts in. We're going to take 5 volts out of it to power the Raspberry Pi. We're going to connect the Pi via the... Um, sorry. We're going to connect the Pi via the USB-C so the Raspberry Pi can talk to it. It's getting power from it. And then all the other connectors on here are short connector lengths that go from this 14 pin and allow me to run like, here's the extruder motor. I'll just take this to the e extruder motor on the SKR board. So it's more of a um, quality of life thing. So if I need to, I can take the tool head off. All I have to do is take the 14 pin cable off the tool head and remove three screws and the whole tool head comes off and I can go over to the bench and work on it. Um, if I need to work on the electronics, then I have to get into the back panel and mess with stuff, but I can disconnect things from the tool head right here versus having to go to the tool head and have wires go on the full length like a Prusa Mark III does. Right, so it's more of quality of life things that LDO puts in these kits. So PCB placement, our SKR um, Pico, I'm gonna go over on this side. So let me, our Pico is gonna go over here and it gives us a few measurements. <clears throat> In those measurements are about 30 millimeters from this bottom extrusion. So I'm going to get my ruler out, lay it about right at the extrusion, and we need to be 30 millimeters away. And that would put it about right there. So I'm just going to rotate it over and clip it in place, and boom. So that's clipped in place. I know that my center trough is going to be about 20 millimeters away to do the center trough, which is the remaining of my trough. Once again, I'm just going to take a quick gander here at 20 millimeters. Yeah. About where it goes is right there. And we'll VHB tape this in, but what I'm going to do is clean up these edges real fast because there's a lot of really nasty edges on this. And I don't want to stand a chance of tearing up any wiring. So let me trim these down a little bit and trim them down, square them up, and file them, file them down.
that went flying, so that's pretty good. We just uh, put a little bit of a file on this, clean up that edge. I don't want to cut any wires. Okay, so we'll pop the top off of that. We'll get some BHB, get a couple of pieces of BHB on this, and then we'll play fun trying to get the, the backing off the VHB like we did the last time. Wow, it's almost 10 o'clock. Okay, it has GPIO and 3.3 .3 volt on the top, and then the NeoPixels are on the bottom. I just know there's NeoPixels on them. I just got to um, figure out what the pins are and where they're at so that we can use them. That would be like an easy way of doing the... Um, Oh, gracious. Words. Words, words, words. Um, doing like the, the NeoPixel side panels like um, Chris has on his. Yeah. He's using one of these boards. You'll be able to do that a little bit easier. See if we can get these off. Early Diesel, thank you for running me around today. Was your wife happy that you came back from the Dragon Den without anything this time? His last couple of times he's come by, he's taken like printers and filament and a bunch of other stuff home with him. He normally doesn't get out of here without taking something. All right. Did that just by a note. Let me let me turn that back to like that little. Okay, figure out twenty millimeters again. Okay, uh, yeah, I can work on that evil diesel. Okay, so we're going to have to skip around a little bit because we don't have our Raspberry Pi just yet. But we, we should be able to keep going with some of the stuff 
Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get that to you, Eagle Diesel. Um, it's going to be somewhere on Free Heathens um, uh, Discord server. So the SKR Pico connections. And this step will start hooking up the connections to the SKR Pico. We'll start by connecting the cables that were previously routed from the bottom. So we're going to need the bed thermistor. Okay. So these are power and a end stop. We're just going to fold that out of the way there. Um, we've got We've got a bed thermistor here. Um, the pins were already crimped. What we just needed to do was put the two pin connector on it. And the good thing is, is there's no polarity involved on a thermistor, so we can just put it in whichever way they fit. Both in the same direction. Or put one in and then the other one in because, of course, they're slightly askew of each other. Flip that in, make, give it a little tug, make sure that they both clipped, which they did. And this is our bed thermistor. So we're going to look at our diagram for where our bed thermistor goes. It does show us here, um, but I'm just going to double check. Always good that they give you your your diagram right here to make it easy. And our bed thermistor or THB is the top connector on the left side. This is our top connector and it, or our connector, and it goes to the top one here on the left side. And then we'll just take this and route it nicely in the cable trough. And this is going to be our bed heater. And I know that the B, um, the B side of this is the one that I plugged in to the fuse. So that needs to be coming from the power side. So on my connector here, So the power is the first connector. The heated bed will be the second connector. And it's power on the left. And yeah, 24 volt on the left and signal pin on the right. Screwdriver. We're going to slip our barreled connectors in the holes. Try to put our ferrule connectors in the hole. Make sure they're pushed in all the way. Just apply some pressure from the bottom a little bit. Make sure that they stay in as we tighten them down. Okay. Give the little tug to make sure that it stays in there. And then we're going to bring these wires around. 
and just gently lay them in there, kind of out of the way. Now we've got our three pins for our RGB NeoPixel. Um, and there's a link that says how to connect your housing up. And we're definitely going to need to follow that link. And I'm definitely going to need to try and find the three pin connector that comes with that. Okay, so we're going to click on that link. All the cables run through the cable chain. We can now install the connector housing. There's no polarity for thyristor for the NeoPixel. We added a color coded heat shrinks to each wire. The red, red wire, is the 5 volt. Okay. The white is the data and the black is the ground. You're using an SKR Mini E3 or SKR Pico as the main board. You can refer to the following photo to install the housing. Or we can look on our handy dandy um, pinout diagram. And it says NeoPixel. And we need to look at the way that the connector is going to slot in. So I've got 5 volt, and 5 volt is on the right side of this connector. So the connector slots in that orientation. So this 5 volt is going to go on the right hand side. My data or signal is in the middle. And my ground is going to be on the left hand or top side of the board. That one goes in there. So this is going to get plugged in right there. And then we're just going to bring in our cable and just lay it in here in a manner where it can lay in there and be out of the way. I won't. I'm going to call it quits here. We got a little bit of a late start because I started to come online at 5.30 and I had woofed something down for dinner. That was not a good choice for food. And the quickness with what I ate it was not a good choice either. So we'll, we'll just go that route. Now we need the 24 volt in for the power. And we've got two lengths, right? One's shorter, one's longer. The shorter one is going to go to the SKR. The longer one is the one that's going to go all the way up to the top and connect in here. So once again, we've got red is positive, black is negative, and our power connector is 24 volt in on the left and ground on the right. So I'm going to go in that orientation, and of course I can't flip those around, so um, ground and power, if we can get to go like that. I'm going to open up our terminal screw downs. Line up our barrels. Or attempt to line up our ferrules. Let's see if we can't do it. No, oh, they're just not open far enough. There we go. Ground cables in. And tighten down. Now for the power cable, get that in there.
Okay. Now I'm going to reset my 30 millimeters since I just moved that drastically. Out there. And then we can take this cable and do like we did with the other power cable and just kind of rat it down and up the trough so it's out of the way. I'll give you guys a little bit of a close up sneak peek for what we've got so far. So We've got our heater bed thermistor, so our bed thermistor, our RGB, our power in, and our bed heater. So that's everything we've got in so far. Um, now, the other thing that we could do, this is our D end stop. And our Z end stop, according to our diagram, is the bottom connector right here. And I just want to make sure that we've got signal, then ground. So when the connector plugs in, it should be signal and then ground, which it is. So we'll slip that in. And we'll snake this around. Just kind of get it out of the way. Like that. And then we've got this other connector here, which is our filament detection. So this comes over to this special leg that we um, installed that basically has a filament runout sensor configured using a an end stop and a bearing that's underneath the end stop inside the printed part there. So this is our filament detect pen, which we're going to put into the um, E0 end stop, which is right next to our NeoPixel. And once again, it's the signal on the left and ground in the right. And I know I'm using red and black I, I know I probably shouldn't use red and black, but I'm going to. And that's going to plug in right there. And then we'll just bring this down and around as well and add it to our cable. And that, my friends, is where we're going to stop for the night. Um, I will go ahead and try and get that... Um, that uh, board on order. And by that board, I'm talking about the board for the Raspberry Pi that'll go right here where the box is. Um, but we've got all of this stuff here. Um, once again, end stop, all of our motors are on this side. This side will be our fans. Um, but yeah, we're doing good. These would be our BNA motors. It might actually tell us to install or plug those in next. Results look like this. Hey, look, it does tell us to go ahead and put the steppers and then the ZN stop. So we've already put the ZN stop in. Um, let's do the motors. So. The B stepper, this side, goes into the X. So once again, E, X. This is going to go over here into the X. This one is going to shoot across. 
and it's going to come over and go into the Y motor. Be the next one down. Really do anything. I may add a uh, zip tie right there just to kind of hold these wires together a little bit, keep them out of the way, make it a little bit nicer. Then we'll have the Z motor, um, which we had a cable for. So we'll plug in our six pin side down here. And then our Z motor. We've got Z1, Z2, it can go into either one. We're gonna put it into the one right next to our X and Y motors. Try to. There we go. I'm just going to kind of loop this around underneath the board a little bit. And then run my cable in. And once again, we're just trying to keep our cables neat, clean, out of the way um, as much as possible. Because nice, clean wiring just, it looks nice, it speaks to people. So we're going to just try and, and do our best to keep our wiring nice and clean. Um, yeah. Okay, that, and as I muck with it, it twists and turns around. I will work on cleaning that up some. Um, but yeah, there is our wiring so far. We're making good progress. So, set this down here and yep, and that's where we're gonna call it good. We'll come back on, what is today, Thursday? We'll come back on Saturday. Um, the, let me see. So we'll come back on Saturday and we'll continue to work on our wiring um, and like something like this, I am probably might be uh, snipping this a little bit shorter because like I can almost run it all the way to the tool head. Um, so we don't need that long. Um, so I might make that one a little bit shorter. We'll see. But we will come back on Saturday and continue the wiring event that we have. And I'm gonna order, uh, I'm gonna look for and order one of those USB hubs um, for the Raspberry Pi Zero so that we can get that installed um, as well. And then we should be able to finish wiring up and work on, yeah, software at that point. So I think we're doing great. Hey, Aaron, how are you? How are you? Uh, we're working on a Voron ourselves. Let me um, switch a view real fast. So we've been working on our Voron. We're working on getting our wiring done up. I am gonna slide this on just so when I move this up, it doesn't go everywhere. Um, like crazy mad horse will. Um, but we've made some progress. We've got our tool head installed and uh, our pico billicles installed. Um, so that's all good. We got our belts done. And we just started into the wiring. And of course, it uh, 
Yep, and definitely bring your, your coffee with you on Saturday. Um, I am going to slide this back in here for now. And I will, I don't know if I'm going to need any other parts. I will try and look and see if there's any other parts I'm going to need. Um, I don't think there is. By the way, there's a nice pretty cover that's going to go over this. And this, so your screws are going to come up through here to mount it in the back. So it's going to look like this. And then this um, groove that's right here, it's got the two holes on it. You're going to run your, your uh, Bowden tube through here and then run a uh, tie wrap through there. And that's going to keep your Bowden tube forward of your belt so it doesn't rub against your belt, right? Um, and it's got the nice little reset, once again, to cover all your pens so you're not damaging any pens. And you do have a hole right here. This used to be for the Z end stop when the Z end stop was up here at the top. Now it's a good place to run your NeoPixel, uh, your wiring for your NeoPixel. So, yeah. Cool things. We made good progress. Um, and I think we're we're good for the night now. Um, I've got to call it a night. Um, I might have to eat something and hopefully it stays down this time. Um, thank you everybody for being here and dealing with my, my start and stop. Yes, you're still here. Awesome, dude. Um, who do we want to raid out to? Who do we have as a potential raid target? Um, an Ash Monster, Mocha Maid. What's Mocha Maid still? Itty Bit Games, The Jang, Jeff, Jeff Gwynn. You guys got any options? All right, shut up. Take it easy. Um, let me jump over to main Twitch to see who we got. It only gives you like five selections. I know there's a lot more people in that. Profit DNA, Ugly Moo. Um, Chris Perillo, of course. Stephen Poole. Stephen actually on there, or is he just... Uh, he's AFK and just has friends going. Um, ugly Moo looks like he's working on a printer, trying to get stuff going. You guys feel, yeah, just prints, gotcha. Uh, Mokamate, oh, it's their third anniversary. That's why they're probably still on so late. Okay, yeah, let's go do Mokomade then. Let me get that going here. All right, folks, we're going to head over to Moco Maid. They are not a PG-13. They're, they're an adult. Uh, they're a couple of siblings. They're really great. Um, let's go over and raid them. And thank you all so much for being here. And I will see you all on Saturday, early morning at 10 a.m. Bye now. Have a good one.